I, well, I want to share something that's been linked to us in our assembly. And I want to talk about uh, a subject that we have practiced for some time, and that is uh, fasting. Uh, I think it's really important that we, we understand just a little bit about this subject. In the last year, our congregation, the most of the congregation, I wouldn't say all, but the most of the congregation, on the first Wednesday of each month, we have a declared day of fasting and prayer. And uh, we encourage the whole congregation to do it. Now, some men said that they were unable to do it when they had such a taxing job and after work. So I thought, well, I'm kind of soft and I had some fence posts that I had to put in around our place. And you know, that's not a very easy job for someone who hasn't been doing it. So I said, well, I'm going to do it on my day of fasting and prayer. And if I can make it through the day, then what I'm asking these men to do, I'm not asking to do them something that's impossible for them to do. So I went out and I put in fence posts, and of course I can, you can talk to the Lord while you're pounding in fence posts. Don't you believe that? You don't have to be on your knees to talk to God. I could talk to the Lord, I could communicate to Him, I could, I could go over scriptures, I could think about things I was thinking about. No one was bothering me, I was just putting in these, digging these holes and putting in these fence posts and putting up some wire and and working around cleaning up in our yard. So when I get up and ask the people if they would fast and pray uh, for that Wednesday, and I said, no, and I know you can do it, because I said I did it myself last week, to prove that we could do it. So we, we can do it if we really want to give ourselves. I believe that even if the work was taxing and it was really hard that day, that you'll find that if you'll give yourself to God, that God will give you uh, a super abundant strength during that day that you say, I don't know how I made it through the day you'll feel better at the end of the day than you did when you ate a great big meal and you had to digest it along with your trying to work. So we, I want you to, I want, we want to share. I want to share some. And uh, we have had the congregation that have taken this one day, that's only 12 times a year, as a, a congregation of people that we fast and pray together. And I believe that it has brought us together. I believe that it has brought us into unity. And uh, we all sort of feel the same way when we come together in that meeting on Wednesday night. Everybody feels a little hungry. <laughs> and when we, we come together, we sort of have something in common. I know that he hasn't had something better than I've had. We've had the same diet during that day. And we can come together and we've had some meetings that... Uh, on that fasting day that God has just moved in in a beautiful and a wonderful way. We've seen uh, miracles that have been performed as we have fasted and prayed. And we, we have felt that God would have us pray for our community because we believe that we have a responsibility to our community to reach our community for Christ. And the only way that we can do that, it's not the responsibility of your pastor to reach your community. It's the responsibility of that congregation or that body of people to reach that community. So we can't do it by ourselves. We need the people of God. And uh, I've shared, and I, no, I'm not going to go into that one there. That's, a, that's another message. Uh, but we need you if we're going to share what God would have us to share in a community. We have to be together. And as our brother has read tonight, behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. We have to move in unity. Unity is one of the greatest strengths that you have in any body of people. If we move together, we're not speaking against each other, but we're all speaking the same thing. God said, I would that you would be of the same mind and of the same judgment. In 1 Corinthians 1.10, I believe it is. Of the same mind and of the same judgment. So that if we would have to come to the place of a judgment within our congregation of people, that we would all be of the same mind and we'd all agree to the judgment of whatever that judgment may be. And I think that's important. I think discipline is important. And if I can't learn to discipline myself in an area of fasting, when I'm disciplined in the church, I'm not going to be able to take that discipline in either. Is that true? Now God says that we ought to discipline in the church. And I think we've failed to discipline as we ought to discipline. He said it's up to us in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we as the church, it's our responsibility to discipline those that are within. God says he'll not touch anyone that is within the body of Christ. That's the responsibility 
of leadership and of that congregation to do the disciplining of those that are within. God said that if they will not receive your discipline, then he said you put them out. And if you put them out, then God says, I will deal with them. Now notice, God says, and God will never ever deal with anyone if they're not behaving themselves properly within a body of believers, if we don't take our rightful place in disciplining them within the body of believers, God won't touch them, God won't work in their life, God won't do anything for them because we have failed to fulfill what God has told us that we ought to do in the Word, in disciplining that individual. And if you'll discipline him and he will hear it, then he will be strengthened to become a strength to the body of Christ. But if he'll not hear it and he refuses to hear it, you put him out and God says he will deal with him. Now we've had this happen in our congregation. Uh, we had one young fellow that came to us and uh, we tried to discipline him and we, we just couldn't get anywhere with him. He wouldn't hear us. So finally we just said to him, listen, if you won't obey, if you won't follow what we have asked you to follow, we're going to put you outside of the church. We don't want you to come to the church. We don't want anyone to have any fellowship with you. And we told the congregation, we don't want you to, to fellowship with this person. You leave them entirely to their own. And we put him out. He came running back in about three weeks. And he had been in, he had been in trouble. Uh, see, we put him out where God could deal with him. And we told him what was going to happen. Don't put him out and just put him out. But explain to him what God says in his word. You put him out and I'll deal with him. And he said, now... We, you wouldn't listen to us, so we're going to leave you to God. God's going to deal with you from here on. He got hit over the head with a two before. He was in accidents. Everything imaginable could happen to that fellow in three weeks. And he came running back, and he said, I want you to receive me again, and whatever you ask me to do, I'll do. Now, he'd continue to be a problem to us within the church. As long as we'd allowed him to sit in that position without bringing discipline to his life, he'd have always been a problem. He'd have caused division within the church. I don't believe we'd ever gone on or had any progression in our body as long as we have that division in our midst. Division will destroy what God wants to do. Division will, will tear and divide, and God cannot work in the midst of division. Now, I'm not talking about disagreement. We can disagree on many things, but we can still have unity. Now, Mel and John and Daryl and myself, we work together in the church, and we disagree on some things we disagree on, but we can still have unity. We can still believe together. We can still trust together. We can still move together, and we just move away from the areas to where we would disagree until we finally come to a place that we would understand it, and we can agree in those areas, and we've come to those places of agreement in many areas. Now, I'm talking about fasting because I believe that fasting is something that teaches us something about discipline in our Christian life. I think it's important. And uh, I'm going to just read a scripture here from Matthew chapter 17. Begin to read at verse 15. And uh, we'll just read these verses here and then we'll be referring to several other portions of scripture as we share. And I'm going to try to be fairly brief, and my wife is going to share some on fasting because she shared several in several of the Women's Ago um, retreats on this subject of fasting. So I want her to share some. She's been uh, fasting on every Wednesday now for I don't know how many years, several, several years. How many years is it? Nine years? Every Wednesday she fasts, takes, doesn't eat on Wednesday. And uh, I have started in the last year, and I've been doing that. Uh, that, and our, our family, our daughters, join with us, and they fast on that Wednesday. We take one day a week. And I believe that it's good for health purposes as well as uh, spiritual. I think you feel better. You know, I kind of find sometimes I get kind of sluggish. And I find that when I, I kind of look forward to the day of fasting, to where you can get your system cleared out, and you start to think a little bit clearer again, and you get it all cluttered up. By the time the next Wednesday comes, you just look forward to it, so you can get yourself cleared out. Just drink some water and, and you'll feel good. Flush yourself out a little bit and you'll feel better. Okay. Amen. All right, for uh, Matthew chapter 17 and verse 15. He said, Lord, have mercy on my son. 
the man who came bringing his son, for he is a lunatic and sore vexed, for oft times he falleth into the fire and oft into the water. And I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithful and, and uh, perverse generations, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him. And the child was cured from that very hour. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could not we cast him out? Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, If ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed hence to a yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Howbeit, he says, this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. Now, we could talk about many different kinds of fasts. There are several different kinds of fasts that are taught throughout the scriptures. And I believe that we can fast from in many different ways, but as I have studied the scriptures, I would say that in the subject of fasting that he has referred, God has referred, I would say mostly to fasting, and that is in relationship to food. And um, I think that we, we need this for, for this benefit of the discipline of our life and also for, for health purposes. And it can be uh, a tremendous discipline in your life to come to that place of learning to give yourself to him and to, to be able to, to let God minister to you in that time of, of hunger. Now, I, I, I think that the scripture says, Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And I say that we're living in a country where we really know very little about hunger or thirst. And when I fast and I feel hungry, then I begin to say, now, Lord, what are you trying to teach me through feeling these hunger pangs that I feel in my stomach? And he said, do you hunger and thirst after me like you hunger and thirst after food? You see, there's a lesson to be taught, and you're becoming hungry. If you don't know anything about hunger, then you really don't know what it is to have a real hunger and a thirst for the things of God. And I say that if you can go and you can, you can let yourself go a day or 24 hours and you begin to feel that real hunger, then you know what it is to know what it is to have a real hunger and thirst after the things of God. So fa fasting um, should mean that one determines to seek the Lord and until God meets with him. You hunger and thirst after God and I've determined that I'm going to seek God until God meets with me. And sometimes, that fasting and prayer, we can go on for two or three days. Brother Cecil Quist was telling me here that he had a group that he was leading, and he had a tremendous burden for this group that he was leading in a house meeting. So he started to fast, and he fasted a day or two, and he found that through fasting and prayer that his mind became clear that he was able to answer questions that he had, didn't even know. And I believe that this is true when we become clear in our thinking toward God that we give ourselves to God, that we seek God, and we seek God until God answers us. And we would be hearers of the Word of God. Now, another thing, fasting means uh, persistence in, in praying. Now, we may pray often, but not too many of us pray too much. Amen? persistence in praying. I, you fast and you become persistent in your praying. And if you set a day a week that you set aside that you will fast and pray and give yourself to prayer, then when you're hungry you'll remind yourself that this is the day that you have given that you ought to pray. And when you're walking somewhere, you can pray. If you're just sitting somewhere, you can pray. But you give yourself to that day of giving yourself to prayer and to fasting. And there's nothing to remind you that can remind you better that you're to be 
constantly in touch with God than to have a hungry stomach that's reminding you and you feeding your mind into how your stomach feels so that you get your mind on God and off of your stomach. And if you get your mind on God, you'll find that you can get your mind off your stomach. Not right? So it really brings you to the place to where you, you, you wait on God until you're believing God to give you the answer. So fasting means persistence. I really want to hear from God. And if I really want to hear from God, I'm willing to give this time to Him that, that I may be able to hear from Him. And then fasting is a deliberate clearing of the way for prayer, laying aside weights and hindrances. You know, there are weights and hindrances that come into your life that hinder you from talking to God. There are just hundreds and one different things that will come across your way. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, he says, Wherefore, seeing we are also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight, and the sin which doth so easily beset us, running with patience the race, the race that was set before us, looking unto Jesus. Looking unto Jesus. The author and the finisher. Let us set aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us in coming to wait on God and give ourselves to God until we receive an answer. You know, we want an answer from God, but we don't want to really give ourselves to God. God says if you want an answer, I believe that sometimes to get an answer from God, it costs us something in the discipline of our own life that God wants to know if we're really sincere about getting an answer from Him or not. <coughs> Now since, so faith is that spirit taking hold of your, your heart. And we see that in, in Hebrews chapter 11, we have that great subject of faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. So I believe that, as he says here, that we ought to weigh, lay aside every weight in the 12th chapter. He goes right on from the 11th chapter. And if we have the great heroes of faith that we can, we can take from this scripture as a command to lay aside hindrances to our prayer life or hindrances to our faith because I believe that faith and prayer and fasting are very closely linked together. I don't know whether they can really be separated that much or not. I believe that we need them if we're going to progress in our Christian experience. On Matthew chapter 13 and verse 22, so that receiving, re speaks of receiving seed among the thorns, is, a, is he, that, he that receiveth the seed among the thorns, is he that heareth the word, and the care of the world, and the deceitfulness of riches, riches choke out the word, and it becomes unfruitful. Now receiving, but the care of the world chokes out what God is saying, until we can become unfruitful. You see, God can speak to you, and God has spoken to me many times about doing particular things, and I say, yes, Lord, I know you're talking to me, but Lord, I'm too busy today, can I do it tomorrow? And I put it off, and tomorrow I say, well, Lord, the next day, and the next thing you know, I've forgotten it. And then I find that God speaks to me again, and I put it off again, and you know that if God speaks to you once about something and you don't do it, the next time God speaks to you, don't hear Him nearly as loud. And if you don't obey Him the next time, the next time He'll speak to you and you can just barely hear Him. And the next time He speaks to you, you can't hear Him at all. You become completely deaf to what God is wanting to say unto you. If you'll not hear God, the first time that he speaks to you. And I say that we have to, we have to be obedient to God. And uh, I say that if you, if, I think it was Bill Gossard who said, when God speaks to you, you write down what God has said to you to let him know that you are taking account of what he's saying, that you're paying attention. Now there are some things that you ought to write down during the week that you can turn to on your day of fasting that God has reminded you of on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday, you say, God, I'm not going to put it off, but I have set aside a day 
that I'm going to give myself to fasting and prayer, and when that day comes, I, Lord, I will, I want to bring it to you, but you have at least given it, and you've written it down so that you can go back to that day, and you can re refer to that, and God can give unto you some answer. I proved this in my own life. We have had some changes in our, in our congregation, and decisions that had to be made, and I met together with John and Mel, and we discussed different things, and we felt that it was good in our discussion, and still I, I wasn't completely at rest in my own spirit regarding what we're, we were doing, and I went to prayer, and I said, God, you've got to give me an answer, and invariably God would point to me a picture from the scriptures, and I would just, it would be just so calm in my spirit, that's what God wanted, and that was the direction God wanted me to take. We're choosing some men one time that we wanted in a, for, a, for a group of men that we wanted to work with, and we were, we were going to pick these men out and choose their names, and there were so many to choose from, you didn't know who to choose from. And, and I said, God, we decided that we, we picked out these men, and I had them list their names, we went through them, and we, we felt we picked out the men that we, we felt were right. And I went to prayer the next morning, and, and God reminded me that um, we should... Uh, just trust God to send the men to us. And uh, believe God that he would send the right one. And I, I, I was reminded of, wasn't it Gideon and his fleece, when he put out his fleece, and, and he went down by the, the brook, and he was going to battle. Wasn't, I mean, we got the right one here or not. But anyway, he was going down to battle, and he had, I don't know how many thousands of men that come to battle. And he said, now, uh, the ones that are fearful to go into battle, let them go home. So the ones that were fearful went home, and he only had uh, a few hundred left, 3,300 or something like that, I think it was, he had left. And he said, now, take them down to the brook. You see, Gideon, he thought, well, how can we go to battle with just, if we have all these men, we can win the victory, we'll have the victory for sure. But Lord was just 3,300, but he said, take them down to the brook. And he said, now, the ones that, that will, will um, if they lap up the water that they will watch when they're drinking, or the others will just go down and drink in the water. He said, send them all home, but just the ones that will watch, they'll scoop up the water and they'll drink it and watch what they're doing. He said, they're the ones that I want you to take into battle. So God said, I'm going to send to you the men that you, you need to work with you. So I, I went back to the next morning and I said to Mel and John, I said, this is what God made real to me, and I feel that this is what we should do, and they said, that feels good to us. So we just began to pray. We prayed, God... Send men to that, to that meeting that night. And they were the men that whoever came were the men we were going to work with. Now we were believing God for 25 men that we'd be able to work with. And you know that God sent unto us that night, he sent to us 27 men. 27 men gathered together that night. And we just knew that God had given to us the men that he wanted us to work with. Because he had revealed himself as we waited on him. And I believe that if we'll learn to wait on God, that God will reveal himself to us as we wait on him. So fasting is simply laying aside every weight, every hindrance to our prayer and to our, our, our life before God. Now the fourth thing, to fast when we pray, ought to be simply claiming the answer to our prayer. God, we want the answer. I want to hear from you. I want to claim that answer to our prayer, that we know that we're praying in the will of God. Now, to fast when we pray should mean, I have set myself to seek God as long as necessary until I hear from God. Praise his name. Till I hear from God. I am determined to hear from God, and I'll be satisfied even if he sends me a no, but I want to hear from God. See, we, oftentimes we tell God what we want to hear. So we're waiting for God to tell us what we want to hear. And if he doesn't tell us what we want to hear, then we, we won't hear it anyway. If God says no to something you're praying about, and you know that it's a definite no, you might as well get up and start to pray about something else. Because God has given you the answer. But many times we don't want the answer, and we'll stay on our knees, or we'll stay in prayer, and we'll say, God, that's not the answer I want. This is what I want. And you're trying to tell God what the answer is going to be. And if you're praying that way, you're never going to get the answer from God. If you're going to go to God and you're going to say, God, I need the answer to this particular question. If he says no, receive the no and go in the name of the Lord. And thank him for the answer. 
So Hebrews chapter 11, verse 2, I've read, uh, or I've quoted to you now, faith, he says, is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And I want to maybe spend a little time tomorrow night, if the Lord should lead in that direction. This is what I was going to speak on last night regarding faith. Faith is something. Faith is the substance of things not seen. So faith belongs to us, and we, we need to claim that faith because it, it is something. Faith is substance. Faith is something we need to get a hold of. And if we don't get a hold of faith, and I can find no other greater way to get a hold of faith than to, to bring yourself to the place of, of prayer, getting a hold of God in prayer, until you, you have a tremendous faith in God. You believe God. And once God's spoken to you, I want to tell you, you know that when God has spoken to you, it's going to come to pass. Praise the Lord. I can remember one time I was in, in prayer regarding someone was going to come to the meeting that night and they wanted me to pray for them. She had migraine headaches. And she had a tremendous headache that day. She had a, a towel wrapped around her head. If any of you know about these migraine headaches, you know possibly what she was going through. And I said, well, I want you to come anyway. And I had prayed that day that God would, would just help me to, to pray for her and believe God for deliverance for her. And when she came, I, I just, God just gave me such faith to believe for her, and I believed that God had healed her. And the moment, I, I don't even remember what all happened, but I remember, I remember what happened to her. I don't know what I prayed. I don't know what God told me, but it was something God told me was just very, very simple. And God told me while I was praying. And I just said to her what God said, and she jumped up off the floor, and she lifted her hands, and she said, I am healed. I'm... Whatever God has spoken. But what I speak, these are the things that don't come to pass, and many times we're speaking our own words, not God's words, and we, we don't see any results because it's not what God has spoken into our heart. Now, if God has spoken something into your heart, and it comes to pass, you know that you're hearing the voice of God. But if there's something that has been spoken into your heart, and many times we hear, I believe there are voices that we can hear, and we can hear a wrong voice. And if you hear a wrong voice, and it says something to you, and it doesn't come to pass, you better check out what voice you're hearing to make sure that you are hearing the right voice, that you're tuned into the right band, and that you're hearing the voice of God. Because if it's God's voice, it will come to pass. If it's not God's voice, it won't come to pass because God's not in it. So the spiritual world, uh, there's failure and because of our, I believe, we have failure in our spiritual life because of our failure to approach God. And if there's any reason for failure in this world at all, I believe it is for want of faith in the spiritual world. If we have failed in the church, if you have failed in your home, if you have failed in your spiritual life, if you have failed whatever you have failed, I believe it is for lack of faith to believe God. I believe that's our failure within our life. So we have an example here as we read in Matthew chapter 17 and verse 19 that I read to you tonight regarding this man who brought his son and he brought him to the disciples and the di disciples couldn't cast or couldn't deliver him. And Jesus said, Oh ye, you just don't have any faith. If you, had, if you would believe and have faith, you would say to this mountain, Be thou removed and it be removed. And be moved hence. But, and then they came to him and and, and Jesus said unto them, But this kind goeth out only by prayer and fasting. I think that was a comfort to them, don't you? They hadn't been fasting, no doubt. And Jesus had to bring that to them, that this only went out in this way. Now there can be uh, no true prayer without faith. No true prayer, prayer without faith. If you don't have faith, don't pray. Because you've got to have faith if you're going to pray and you're going to see any result. And yet, prayer is always the way to more faith. If I want to have more faith, I find that if I'm in prayer, the more I'm in prayer, the more faith I have. But faith answers prayer, but I need prayer to come into that area of, of faith. Now, there can be no higher um, degree of faith except through prayer. When you have that, that prayer to believe, and prayer needs fasting. I believe prayer needs fasting. I think that fasting, prayer, and faith are inseparable. 
If you're going to have faith, you're going to have to pray. And if you pray, you're going to have faith. And if you're going to get right down to business and pray, you're going to have to fast and pray, and then you're, that faith will be released within you. And there's a tremendous release in fasting and prayer and coming to Him. It is said of one church that they were complimented for their, for their faith. Because they had faith in God. They believed God for, for great and marvelous things. Now when Jesus spoke to spoke the words according to your faith be it unto you he announced the law of the kingdom according to your faith be it unto you now if we want to know where and how faith grows there's only one area that it can grow and I believe that is in at the throne of grace in God's presence that's where faith grows and I found that faith grows in your life as you spend time in God's presence. A husband and wife, when they have a good relationship together, the more they live together, the more they start to act like each other. Uh, my wife knows what I would be thinking. I believe that when we get to know each other, we know how that person would think. Now God says regarding a church, I would to God that you would be of the same mind and the same judgment. Now there's no way that you can be of the same mind and the same judgment unless you know one another. If I were to work with Brother Tim here for a year or two, I would begin to understand his thoughts. And if someone were to come to me and say, Brother Tim said this, me knowing Brother Tim, I'd say, yes, I believe he did say that. But if he didn't say that, if I really knew that man, I'd say, no, I can't believe that Tim would say that. I think you've misinterpreted my brother. But if I knew him, I would know that he said that. And this is the same as we've worked together. People would come to me and they would say that John said this. And I'd say, well, yes, I believe that John would say that because I can hear him saying it, because I know him. But if, he say, if someone has said that John has said something that I can't believe that John would say, I say, listen, we better go to John and find out that he said that because I think you misinterpreted him. And the closer you get to one another, the more that you understand one another. Now, the closer you get to God, the more you're going to understand God. And there's only one way you're going to get close to God, that you must have faith in Him. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And the only way that I can get close to God, I believe, is in prayer and in fasting. There's one way that, of course, we get close to God through His Word. God reveals His Word as we wait on Him. So faith needs prayer, and prayer needs fasting for their full growth. If they're going to be full growth in prayer and in faith, we need the three together. So prayer is the, on the one hand with which we grasp the invisible. Prayer, we grasp that. And fasting, on the other hand, is in which we, we, we grasp that which is visible. Um, I think there's nothing that drives us or makes us understand where we're at and brings us to this understanding within the world regarding our sense of need in our spiritual life than there is to understand your sense of need for food for the physical body. We are driven to eat. In fact, the Bible says that many of us, our God is our belly. Our bellies, we, we would far rather feed our belly than we would to starve our belly and to feed our spirit. Now, we know that this is the way that God, or that the devil came when he tempted Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. How did he tempt them? What did he tempt them with? Food, didn't he? Eat this. If you eat this, you'll become like God. And when, when, the, when Satan came to tempt uh, Jesus, when he'd been out in the, in the wilderness for 40 days, what did he say to him? He said, turn this stone into bread. He was tempting him with food. And he, because of the, the hunger that he would feel, that he would turn, and that was the, the strongest temptation they could bring to that man at that time of his hunger, knowing that he needed that to sustain this physical being that he lived in. Now, Jesus was tempted by the devil to turn stones into bread. And, they, and the, the devil will constantly tempt us to 
to do anything but to get to God by the means that God has set down in the Word of God. You see, our thoughts are not His thoughts. Our ways are not His ways. Our thoughts and our ways are to, to be full, and if you're full, you're happy and you're satisfied and you go to bed with a full stomach. Many people have said, if I can go to bed with a full stomach every night, I'll be happy through the rest of my life, and we do that. That's all we do. Fill our stomach, go to bed. Fill our stomach, go to bed. We make sure we've got a good enough job to fill our stomach and go to bed. But we never would think of allowing that stomach to be empty until we can get in touch with God. As God said, we ought to by fasting and by prayer. You know that joy expresses itself by eating. I, we had a group of women that used to meet in our church and they, would, they were called the Lively Stones. <laughs> and they would go on a diet and everything else to lose weight. And some of them needed to do that. They were getting up there, it was pretty nearly dangerous for the floor joists in the church. But as soon as they would lose 10 pounds, they would go out and celebrate by buying 5 pounds of chocolate so that they would eat it. So Joy will always celebrate by feeding this particular individual. Isn't that true? We, we go to feasts and something, and we go to a wedding, and what do we think of? We think of, of eating. If someone comes to our house, we, we feed him. Now, I'm going to just put in a plug here for, for Brother Tim. Uh, you know, when I go out, when I go out visiting people, people seem to feel that the only thing that a pastor wants when he comes is a cup of tea and a, and a cookie. You know, you go to, to five or ten houses in a day and you get a cup of tea and you get something to eat. Uh, you wish that the next place you'd go, they'd just say, listen, let's just talk about the Lord. <laughs> now, this is, sometimes we have good fellowship around a cup of tea. We're not saying that we don't. It's good at times. But many times I think that we just really need to get our thoughts and our attention on Jesus and not upon satisfying this human individual, but to really get our attention focused on the Lord Jesus Christ. So fasting helps to express and to deepen and to confirm God's Word to our hearts and to our living. Now prayer is the reaching out after God and for the unseen, and fasting is the letting go of all the seen and the temporal. We're able to let go of that which the things that are are seen are 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 temporal, but the things that are not seen are eternal. And I say we need to get a hold of some eternal things that God wants us to lay a hold of in our life. So there's a, there's a, a scripture in in uh, Isaiah chapter 58, and I believe my wife is, has memorized this chapter, and I'm going to ask her to just share some of what fasting has meant to her and some of her sharing with some of the ladies on this particular subject. But in Isaiah chapter 58, he says, Is not this the fast that I have chosen, to loose the bonds of wickedness? To loose the bands of wickedness. And I believe that, that we can loose bands of wickedness in fasting, in spending time in the presence of God, in emptying our stomach and allowing our mind to be clear unto God. You know that if you hadn't eaten tonight, that you'd be far clearer than you are in this service? You know that? You'd be, we could be more alert if we hadn't eaten. We would be uh, more awake because you, you'd be surprised the energy that it takes to just to digest the food that you eat at a meal. And it, we become more alert when we when leave and allow ourselves to be empty once in a while. Praise the name of the Lord. So I'll ask my wife if she'll just come now and she'll share some. I've just shared some, some outlines here and just some things in the scriptures that we see regarding fasting and its importance to us and the help that we receive from it. One of our uh, men of God has said, if you would pray with power, we would pray with fasting. And I really believe in it with all my heart. It was a tragedy that struck our home. My father had a very drastic accident. He was a heavy man, and, and he'd fallen from a scaffold onto a cement floor. I was in Winnipeg. My husband and I were pastoring there. My folks were in Vancouver. And when the call came, it was just a, like a knife went through me because I think so much of my parents. And I said, you know, I had a food of, or a plate of food at the table, and I left the plate. 
And it's probably the first time that I'd done that outside of being sick. And I went to my bedroom and I stayed there until I had a peace from God that he was going to hold on to my father long enough for me to fly to Vancouver so that I could just be with him. And it was really beautiful that, that God laid it on me in this way and it was like an open door to me. You know, nobody had talked about fasting. It came directly from the Spirit of God. Of course, the Word is full of it, but I mean at that time, it wasn't that we'd been dwelling on it or teaching on it in the church. So it was really like God laid it on my heart and there were many, many days that I sat there and missed many a meal just praying for him and he came out of that coma after about a month and they said it was only because of the members of the family there were others beside myself we have a big family 11 children and almost all of us took our turn at the bedside day and night some of us and you know it was a beautiful thing but it was after that that God showed me that there was a power in fasting and that there was something within you there is an incentive to believe God and I can't explain it to you except that you experiment and experience it for yourself and then I began to study on fasting because I thought how come we're not doing this thing why is it that we've sort of left off and of course there were many that I know I had the feeling myself that I shouldn't even share it with very many. Just my husband knew and my mother or whoever I happened to be at their home the day that I would fast because I didn't want anybody to think that I thought I was better than they were or super spiritual. And I had this feeling that I would hide it. And for years, Vern knows for years, I never shared with anybody, but for years God had so laid it on my heart to fast. And you know, I want to share with you that the first few days that I did fast, the first few weeks that I would fast a day a week, I remember one night that I had such a terrible headache. I hadn't been given to, my, given to migraines, but I had such a terrible headache. But do you know that met, went to bed with it and uh, appeared that, you know, I've known so many on the, it's that beautiful discipline of fasting just because they have felt something in their physical body. And a woman was shared just last week and she said God had been really speaking to her about fasting and she said the thing that worries me she said that the times that I have even missed a meal I get such a headache and I said to her Ruby do you ever have headaches any other days and she said well yes of course and I said what do you do then well she said oh well she says I'm not going to worry about that headache when it comes then and she, she, I went into Sierra last Wednesday and she'd fasted all day and, and she was just rejoicing. In fact, she'd carried it over until noon the next day and I'd met her in the morning and I'd had my breakfast and she hadn't even had breakfast. And just the, the, just the clearness of mind. But so many times it's our mind and that gets in the way of our Spirit. You know, our, our mind is the seat of our self-consciousness and, and the way we think. And I believe that God would have us learn many principles. I know that I'm learning myself. You know, every time that I fast and every year that goes by, I experience something greater from God. And I want to tell you that that power that you experience isn't a great big noise. I think my prayers are getting quieter than they ever have in years. But the first time I went on a 10-day fast was two and a half years ago, and it was because our son had been doing drugs, and it was su such an excruciating thing. And, and uh, my older daughter... And I, she wanted to go on a fast with me, and I asked my husband's permission, and you know, it was beautiful, but on the ninth day of that fast, that boy came home, and he said, Mom, you better, well, on the eighth day, he said, you better, you better start eating. And I said, no, I said, I feel I'm to pray for you before I go off this fast, and you know, he waited till noon the next day. I was out somewhere in the morning, and he waited around. I didn't know whether he would or wouldn't because he hadn't gotten out of bed in the morning. But, you know, I just simply took his hand and prayed very few sentences even because I knew that there's no way I want to turn him off by any, any great show or emotion or anything. And I just said, God, you know, just touch his life. And, you know, it was some months after before I even realized that he, the drugs, had just dropped right out of his life. And you know, we're experiencing that there is a power, but there's something about the fasting that 
sort of takes the onus off you. Sometimes we labor in prayer, sometimes we pray as if it all depends on us, and I want to tell you, it depends on God. And we have a confidence that God is the one that's working these things out. And, and I think that one of the things that impressed me the most, most was Matthew, the sixth chapter, and I want you to turn to it because I want you to see something here that has been so precious to me, and I've shared it many times. You know, we couldn't even begin to really. Vern shared a lot already. I, you know, couldn't even begin in this short time to share with you what the Scripture teaches on fasting, but we pray that it will spark a real interest and that some of you will really take hold of this beautiful truth and that you'll see it from the Word of God. And I, and I usually say, and I would like to share with you tonight, that if you're really interested in fasting and the ministry of fasting, I would that you would take your concordance, spend an hour someday and just take your concordance and look up the word fast and see and search out the scriptures and see what God has to say to you because I'm confident that it isn't what we say but it's what the Spirit of God lays upon your heart and you know when it comes to you that you should do it the headaches, nothing else will turn you off in fact you couldn't coax me to eat on fast day because that's my day to give to God and so every time we go to a camp or someplace different Vern and I have to sort of decide are we going to or aren't we you know we're on the Holy Land tour there's so many times there's, there's things you're involved with last Wednesday there was a funeral and we had people over and we decided to give them lunch and everything and I said God you take care of it not a one even asked me why I wasn't eating I was busy serving and doing other things you see and God just took care of it and every time you know but we have to purpose in our heart and once you purpose in your heart you can smell the chicken cooking like that brother bless his heart he cooked the best meal I'm sure today but that's all right <laughs> somebody said get him to save you a piece of chicken I said that isn't fair <laughs> but I thank God that that uh, when we do purpose, the Holy Spirit comes through with the power to go on with it. It certainly isn't any ability of ourselves. I, I was the biggest glutton, and, and like I shared with you Sunday night, just because I, I might not have any excess poundage, um, you know, a lot of excess poundage anyway, um, it doesn't mean that I don't eat. I eat my share and anybody else's that's around me, and I'm the one that cleans up at home, and uh, so, you know, I need it. And I need to fast because I need to give my body a rest, a, a rest, a physical rest. And there is so much in the natural that even physicians are telling us today that I believe God is bringing and restoring a spiritual truth. But in the sixth chapter of Matthew, the sixth verse says, But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Now, there isn't one of you would disagree with me that that praying is necessary. It's something that God has laid on our hearts. We hear many, many messages on prayer. We believe it. We practice it. But I want you just to look over the page. 17th verse. What does it say? It says, but thou, when thou fastest. The sixth verse says, but thou, when thou prayest. The seventeenth says, but thou, when thou fastest. And when I saw that, I said, oh Lord, you're not even leaving an option. You're not saying if you feel like you should fast. The scripture says, but thou, when thou fastest. Just as if that would be part of our daily living or our weekly living or our monthly, how, however so often. You should want to do it. Anoint thine head and wash thy face. And I'm going to tell you that there is a joy that comes within from eating the spiritual food and from feasting on God that comes. And today, even though we haven't partaken of the natural food, which we really do love, yet we have partaken and sensed a satisfying of our spirit that couldn't come any other way. And yet I'm so convinced that just as God intended for us to pray, that he intended for us to fast. And the most beautiful thing about it is that there's no way that we're to go around with a long face and say to everybody, well, you know what day this is. <laughs> this is fast day. And boy, have we ever had a lot of good 
fun with our people at church. We just had a lot of good humor over it. God has really blessed us. And if we see anybody that's looking down in the dumps, you know, we just really share with them about this business of, of having a fast that's a, a glory unto God. And as Vern shared in that Isaiah, the 58th chapter, said, is, it, is not this the fast that I've chosen to loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and that ye break every yoke? And that's on fast day. What time is that for you to be mourning and to going around moping about the cake or, or the piece of steak that you didn't get? God intends that you would so feed on him and your spirit would so be fed that you would know and tap into a resource that is different from that in the natural. And it says, is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry? How'd you like to do that? You know what we've done on fast day? Some of us have given the money that we would have spent on food and we've collected it and given it to some foreign missions project. And you know something else? I was blessed about a month and a half ago when a woman called me. She just had back surgery and she said, Marge, it's fast day at the church. I want you to pick up my three children. <laughs> they were an Argentine couple. And I picked up a boy that was, I would say, Benji's eight years old. Lucia is 11. Marisa is 13. And those children jumped into the car and I said, you do know what day this is. You know what service is. Oh, it's fast service, they said tonight. And I said, uh, yeah. I said, uh, have you been fasting? And they said, oh, yes. And I said, you have? <laughs> I was, I just couldn't get over it. And they were so happy. And they said, oh, we do this every month, you know, on fast day, even if we don't come to service. But at summertime, you see, they could come. And they said, we fast. And I thought, wow. <laughs> you know, I hadn't thought particularly of making or trying to encourage our little ones to, but there was something in those children such a hunger to be part of the body and I'm only sharing it because they wanted to do it you know it's not something if you try to make somebody do it they're moping and moaning and then that is just really taking away all the benefit of the fast but it says is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry and that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house when thou seest the naked that thou cover him and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh and that whole chapter is so beautiful and if there was time I would share it with you because along with this fasting God has given me um, the the belief that I can memorize the Word of God and as I told you Sunday night 15 chapters later I believe that God is able to help me do that do you know the first chapter I memorized was six verses Psalm 1 <laughs> and after that I got courage to go to 1 Corinthians the 13th chapter and after that I got courage to go to Philippians the 4th chapter and then I went to Isaiah the 58th chapter then I went to Matthew 6 Mark the 3rd chapter Luke the 15th chapter and then I landed in John and you know God has so inspired me by his Holy Spirit and the fact that with the discipline and what Vern said about it, there is something really true. It won't come overnight, but I want to tell you that you're going to find by the abstinence of food and the, this discipline that can come into your life that you can discipline yourself to things that you have never been able to do. And I believe that's why the enemy has tried to keep it as such a hidden thing and tried to make you uh, think of anything else but fasting. But you know, the Word of God uh, has blessed my heart and as I've told you, you're going to be thinking about something always. Our minds are at work, at least a woman's mind is. And why not have it turning over and be meditating on the Word of God? Why? Otherwise, I know what it does. It meditates on the things somebody said against you. It meditates on the hurt that somebody's done to you. It meditates on the way the kids have behaved. It meditates on the things that somebody hasn't done, particularly maybe your husband. And you see all these things. And you know, I have, maybe I've been the worst scoundrel. I don't know, but when God laid it on me, 
he's laid it on my heart to meditate on as many of these chapters as I can get through a day, and many, many is the day when I get through the whole business of them, and I know that it's exciting because it just means that many bad thoughts I haven't had that day. I've had thoughts of God, and I've had thoughts that are encouraging, and you know what's happened is that when trials and tribulation has come, and like I said last night, I've known bitterness, I've known defeat, but it's like I can't stay down there. It just comes, it might just be a few hours it used to be years ago that it would might be days now it's just a matter of hours and the spirit of God comes through and he's and it's like he's bolstered me with the principles of the word the principles of forgiveness the principles of submission and you know if you hang on to those things you shall never stay down in that defeated position John the 14th chapter, let not your heart be troubled, you believe in God, believe also in me and my father's house, or many mansions, if it were not so, you all know that as beautiful, and then I went to the 15th chapter, I am the true vine, my father is the husband, and every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit, and you know what God showed me out of that, if you're here tonight, don't draw back from the purging of God because those trials and tribulations that you're going through are just the purgings of God and be thankful because he says that when he's through with you and if a branch doesn't bear fruit he's going to take you away so as long as you're here you can say praise God I know that he's going to work through me and I know that I'm going to be purged now a purging isn't a happy thing while you're going through it but is it ever exciting when the fruit begins to show on the vine and so I thank God for that and then I thought this book of John is so exciting and I went to the 12th chapter and it has a lot of verses then I memorized the 13th chapter all about the foot washing beautiful thing about Jesus and and he himself taking the towel and girding himself and washing his disciples feet and then I thought Do you know I'm going to I'm going to tackle this book of John. Now, you see, two years ago, I'd have thought that was an impossibility. But through the process of a little by little and the discipline of the Word and the fact that I saw that God could sustain me in the natural and in the spiritual, do you know what I have found? I've now added to that John 1, John 2, John 3, John 4, John 5. I'm working on John 6. I've learned about four verses uh, in the four or five days what's today Wednesday four days that we've been at camp and you know um, I am completely positive and I say that uh, it might sound like boasting to you and I trust it doesn't I'm only positive because I know what's behind me I'm only positive because I know what God has done for me in the past that I can go ahead and face the future and my vision is within two years to know the whole book of John now I already know half of it so you know I know that God is going to help me and it's been so exciting and I want to challenge you with this because I'll tell you why we've heard many prophecies and we've heard much written regarding the end times persecution is coming upon us we believe that and if we don't believe it we should really seek God and, and get some word on it because we don't want to be caught unaware but we really want to be aware I don't fear it when, when I know that God is going to bring something upon me, I know he's also going to make provision and a way of escape if that should be. So I'm not worried in that sense, but I want to be ready. I want to be prepared for what's coming. And so I know that if this Bible is taken away from me, I want to know that I'm going to have enough in my heart and I pray to God that he'll keep me close to him and that I'll stay close to him so I can be learning this word till the day I die or until the day that I am uh, put into some state where I can't memorize it anymore but it's so precious and you know we don't have a great bank account uh, in fact even though we own that property we told you about last night we have barely any bank account but I want to tell you that doesn't worry me because we've got a bank account and Vern's been memorizing the word of God my daughter Gail memorized the whole book of Ephesians. She's memorized about 12 chapters and Proverbs 31, just a number of them, just a challenge to her heart. And she's only 19 when she was doing it, 18, 19. But you know, the exciting thing is that your mind doesn't get duller, your mind gets sharper. And I was encouraged by reading an article that said that we only, at the best of times, use 25% of our minds. So maybe God wants us to use the other 75% on something worthwhile. You know, 
You're only at the stage where you're at by the way you feel and the way you look at it. I'll tell you, if you want to believe life begins at 40, that's where it begins and that's where we're at. <laughs> I am anyway. <laughs> Vern's on, on the road up ahead of me there. <laughs> but I'm really excited that God, you know, has so much. You know, I must admit at 39, I felt real dragged out and tired and we've been through a lot of problems. And I said, I don't know what's happened the last two years, but since I've been memorizing that Word of God, I've gone on with my music. I'm now working on my music degree. Something that was completely out of my reach, I thought, at the age of 30. <laughs> I don't know, I must have died about then or something. But you know, I just want to tell you that I don't care what age you're at. We've got people that are 82 and 84 that are looking forward to what God is doing in them. And I don't believe that there's any end to what God wants to show you. But he does require a diligence and an earnestness. He really does. And he says that as we are earnest, and as we seek after, after him, that he will meet us. If we ask and seek and knock, and have you ever noticed that, that asking, seeking, knocking, the A-S-K denotes ask. Have you ever thought of that that way? Somebody shared that with us years ago. So I haven't asked until I've asked and sought and knocked. Asking just isn't the way we take it, just to ask say it once, but asking is when we really ask, we seek, and we knock. Then we've fulfilled what God, I believe, intends by the word ask. And so, you know, as you study these scriptures on fasting, I'm just going to pray that God is going to raise up many of us that will stand together, and we will band together. I was going to tell you that when I fasted, came off that 10-day fast, the very next speaker that we had our church was a Stephen Bancroft. And you know what he said that night? He said when he was put into prison, they put him on a 10-day bread and water fast. And I thought, wow, that's better than even what I had. And I made it. I said, praise God, I'm going to be able to leave at least, live at least 10 days in a concentration camp. Now, you know, don't, don't uh, take that too seriously. Maybe you're dying at the thoughts of it. But I'm even believing that the faith that the martyrs had when they went to death was because they were inspired of God. They were giving their lives joyfully. We're fasting because we want to. We're fasting because we see it as a principle of God. And we're, we're able to give of this meager little bit that we can, this little bit of time, because we love the Lord. It's a service unto God. And you know, the scriptures, Acts 14.23, it speaks of ordaining of elders, they fasted. In Acts 13, verses 2 and 3, there was a fasting, re Barnabas, the separating of Barnabas and Paul, uh, and Paul for the ministry. You know, I just wonder... And I ask God, what has happened to us today that we just vote all the time instead of fasting and asking God to set aside and to bring these things to pass? I would pray that before our, our church elections or whatever you call it, however you feel led or however God has led you, I pray that we will really consider what the scripture has to say, to say about that. But always they fasted and prayed and the Spirit laid on them. Do you know, sometimes we choose men for offices in church and have a tough time getting them out if they're not fitted for the job. How much better that we would fast and trust the Holy Spirit to set those men into the body and then he would back them up with his power and if they were out of order because the Spirit had set them there, you could go and deal with them and they would be pliable, I believe, for you to work with. And so there's so much, as I say, that we could say about fasting and prayer. But I believe that it's something that you're going to find really meets a need in your life, the discipline. And I just want to share something really quick with you. Um, we were in at a meeting a few weeks back, and there were a lot of brethren, all Christian ministers, fellowshipping together, but there were a lot of them that were really disagreeing on a lot of issues. And when I came home that night, you see, John 17 is so full of unity and Jesus praying that the Father, and as he and the Father were one, that we would be one as the body of Christ. And I just wept and wept. It was about 9 o'clock at night, and then it was that the words of a song came to me. And I'm just going to, maybe sometime before the end of camp, I'll sing it. But right now I just feel led to share the words with you because it came as the Spirit of God laid it on my heart. And you know... 
God showed me something that night. I might disagree with the brethren, but I do not dare allow myself to get out of unity. Have you ever thought of that? You know, there's so many denominations, there are so many of us that call ourselves Christians. And in years past, we couldn't even look at one another or listen to one another. And I thank God for what he's doing today. I thank God that we can even be here. And even if you sat down and talked to us in a lot of ways, you, maybe we wouldn't see eye to eye. But I want to tell you that our unity isn't based on agreement. That it's based on the fellowship around Jesus Christ. Amen. And as this burden came in my heart, it says, Oh, we need to know the love of the Father. For he sent from heaven his own beloved Son, that as brethren we may dwell in peace and harmony. Then the world will see and know that he is real. Oh, we need to have the love of our Savior, who came from heaven to die at Calvary. For if we look too hard at one another, we will only see the things that shouldn't be. And isn't that true? Oh, we can't, I don't even dare as a mother look at my children without the eyes of love of Jesus. I don't dare take too hard a look at my husband. And he doesn't dare take too hard a look on me. Because you know that we, if we don't love as Jesus loved, we will only see the things that bug us and, and bother us. And, and you know, oh, it's beautiful to be able to reach out with arms of love to somebody and know that maybe they're not even where they should be with the Lord but that God is going to do the work in their life and that through sharing, and you know, if you come down hard on somebody and tell them the way it is and lay down the rules, and like Brother said this morning, you could have so many rules that you'd be, by the time you were through them, you, you couldn't even keep them yourself, really. But you know, God has a rule of the Spirit, and I'm convinced that the closer that we are to Jesus, that the more disciplined we will be in our walk with him and the last verse says for the basis of our fellowship is Jesus we must never love just when we can agree if we desire to be his true reflection we must radiate God's love for men to see God sent his son and he sent Jesus that we might become the likeness of God to men and women around about us and Anytime I'm tempted to jump on somebody and to say something, I think of that verse when Jesus said, Oh, Father, I pray that they would be one even as we are one. And what did he mean? Didn't, don't you think Jesus knew in the mind of the Spirit and could see up to our day and to the generations past that there would be a lot of disagreements? But don't you think the heart's cry of the Son of God was that we would allow his love, that love that took him to Calvary, to reach beyond, you know, look beyond our faults, as the songwriter has said, and see our need. And I want to tell you that I know that when things are hard, and it's hard to be a Christian, it's only because I don't love enough. I have found in our marriage relationship, which I shared with you last night, I believe, is God's, it likened us to God's relationship to us in the Spirit. When I found that it's too difficult, then I know that I'm not loving the way Jesus should. And you know, how much do I have to do to keep that marriage? How much, I want to tell you, how much did Jesus do for you? Didn't he give his all? Don't, don't we deserve to give him the best of everything that we have? I'll tell you, a marriage where two couples are giving in love one to another without saying, how far can I go? What fringe uh, can I ride on? Uh, can I fool around in this area or in this end? Or, or I, I won't do this or that or the other thing. I don't have to. He's married to me. He's got to. You know, all that kind of thing. When a person comes for counseling and when that's the thing, then we know it's just the love that isn't strong enough. And it's only God that can fill up that natural love of ours and can make it overflow so that there's enough for us and for somebody else. So God bless you. I'm going to close and give it back to Bern. I have that same scripture down that I was going to refer to in Matthew chapter 6 when you pray when you pray and when you fast and he doesn't make any difference there I believe that if we pray and we fasting ought to be as much of our life as praying 
is a part of our life. Um, we know that the Pharisees fasted and they saw nothing. They were fasting and still we look at one man, Cornelius, when um, Peter came to him and he said that he had been fasting and praying. And I believe that that was possibly the reason why he and his household came to a relationship with the Lord. Because he knew the principle of fasting and praying, even though he didn't know God. He knew that principle. And I believe there's a principle that God wants us to understand. Now, I know that uh, sometimes you talk about this and it doesn't sound like the, the uh, spiritual type of a, a thing that we, we want to hear. But I believe that these are important things if we're going to really learn what it is to reign in life. God wants us to be victorious. He wants us to be conquerors and more than conquerors. And we're always wanting to be conquerors without any effort on our part. Just God, you do it, you do this for me, and I'll be victorious as long as God does one thing after another for me. But we don't want to put anything into it ourselves. And he says that we're to what? Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And this is what we're talking about. I'm not talking about your life, your relationship, and your eternal relationship with him. I'm talking about the working out of your life with God that God would have you to put something into this very thing. And if you put something into it, I believe you're only going to get out of it what you put into it. Praise the Lord. And my wife, I remember uh, when the children were not behaving as they ought to have behaved, and she was, uh, it's very hard on a, on a woman, and she was really having a real problem and almost in the state of a, of a nervous breakdown. And she had gone to see the doctor, and the doctor told her that she'd go on tranquilizers, and um, she came home. And I just thank God that she decided that she was going to memorize the Word. She said, I'll memorize the Word of God, and every time I begin to think about this and it gets me upset, I'll rem memorize another scripture. So I say, forget about going to the, to the pillbox and going to see the doctor regarding just get the Word of God and begin to memorize God's Word, and that can, can set your mind at ease. Praise the Lord. She became strengthened in her physical being as she got into the Word of God, began to memorize God's Word. Thy Word have I hid in my heart. And you hide God's Word in your heart, and you meditate on the Word of God, and you'll find that you haven't got time for all of these thoughts that are going to come to your mind, and uh, all the sicknesses that you think you're going to have, and everything that's coming upon you. But if you don't discipline yourself to get to God, and I say there's one thing that you can do, you can learn to discipline yourself. If you do nothing else, it will be a discipline thing that will take place in your life that will be the best thing that ever happened to you in your Christian experience. Praise the Lord. So if you don't accomplish anything out of it the first few times that you do it, at least you'll learn discipline. And if you can say no to your stomach, I want to tell you you can say no to anything. Not true? If you can discipline yourself in not eating for a day, when the devil comes along and says, do this, if you've learned to discipline in that area, you can say, listen, I can say no to my stomach, I can say no to that too. It's a tremendous strength in your Christian experience if we begin to do it. Now we're not putting it on anyone as something heavy and saying that you have to do it. I'm only sharing with you what it's been like. And we've shared it in our congregation and we've got a good, good number of people and my wife has mentioned even young people that come into fasting and prayer. Our, all our young people on the farm, they fast. Every day we have our fasting and prayer, they fast. Many of them work on construction jobs, and they still take that day that they set aside uh, once a month to where they fast with the whole of the congregation. We come together for a time of prayer, rejoicing, and get together. Just does something together when we come together after a day of fasting. We come together, and, and it just boosts you. It just does something for you. Just to be able to praise the Lord together and worship the Lord together and, and wash your face and put on your clothes and do up your tie and shine your shoes and, and appear as though you haven't been fasting. Praise the Lord. Don't feel down because you have to fast. It's a joy to come into that place of that relationship with the Lord. Praise His name. So we felt this on our heart that we should share this with you and, and uh, your pastor will share it with you. And, and I believe if we can get a, prayer, a, a church that is, is willing to discipline themselves in this area, that God begins to move. God begins to answer. God begins to do things because we begin to say, Lord, we mean business with you. I mean it. I mean business with you. We as a congregation, we mean business. 
And we believe that we can stand against the power of the enemy in the name of the Lord Jesus. He says, one shall chase a thousand. Two shall chase ten thousand. And, and if you have ten, well, you chase a few million. And I believe he's talking about the hosts of the enemy. So I can stand myself and I can, I can ward off a thousand of them. But if I can get John to join with me, it's 10,000. And if I can get Mel, we can almost quench what the devil wants to do in White Rock over that night. But if I can get the whole congregation to do it, bless God, we've got that city in our hands. You see, that's why he says, If two or three of you shall gather together in my name, they shall ask what they will, and it shall be given unto them. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. It only takes two or three to really be... Um, to stand against the enemy. If we stand together because one can chase a thousand, two can chase ten thousand, and then you multiply it again with three, boy, he hasn't got that many around, you know. We've, we've soon uh, depleted his numbers if we'll stand together as a mighty army of God's people and believe God together. Praise his